As we look at the little postcard of Jude, we want to consider three things. First of all, we want to see that the saints are exhorted. The saints are exhorted. And that's verses 1 through 3. Then we want to see that the spies are exposed. And that begins in verse 4, and it goes all the way down through verse 23. And then we want to see that the Savior is exalted. The Savior is exalted, and that's verses 24 and 25. Let's begin by noticing that the saints are exhorted. Jude introduces himself in verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. We believe that the Jude that is identified here was one of the half-brothers of Jesus. Remember that Jesus has four half-brothers that are identified in Scripture, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. We believe that the Jude here is that Judas. There is another New Testament epistle that was penned by one of the half-brothers of Jesus, and that is the little epistle of James. And so even though these men were not believers during the life of Jesus, following His resurrection, they did come to faith. And they were used by God to pen two epistles uh, that are for our exhortation. And so here we read of Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. It's interesting that while Jesus was alive on the earth and as Jesus was growing up with Him, He did not believe in Jesus. He did not accept the deity of Jesus. But following the resurrection of Jesus, he became his brother's servant. He was willing to serve him. He was willing to die for him if necessary. And so we see the great change that was wrought in this man. Notice that he identifies himself as the brother of James. This helps us to identify him as the half-brother of Jesus, realizing that this is the James under consideration here. He says, "...to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called." Now notice that as we consider these salutations... We see that he was sanctified by God the Father. We might say that he was purged by Jehovah. We see that he was preserved in Jesus Christ. And we see in verse 3 that he was beloved. And so we have purged of Jehovah, we have preserved in Jesus, and we have preferred of Jude. You remember in Romans chapter 12 that Paul there instructs us in honor, preferring one another? And that's what Jude is doing right here. He will three times in this epistle refer to them as beloved. He does so in verse 3. He will do so uh, as well as we move through the epistle. Notice as we get over to verse 17, but beloved. And then in verse 20, but ye beloved. And so Jude dearly loved these brethren. They were preferred of Jude. Jude preferred these brethren above others that were alive on the earth. These were his brethren, and he was close to them, and he was concerned about them. Now, when we think about the fact that they were sanctified by God the Father, or purged of Jehovah, we think about what sanctification is. And sanctification is being set apart for a holy purpose. These brethren had been called out of the world, and they had been called out of the world with a purpose in mind, and that purpose was to give glory and honor to God, to be His servants. And Jude has already identified himself in that way, and now he identifies them in that way. Notice that they are preserved in Jesus Christ. You might recall in John chapter 15, the exhortation to abide in Christ. The branches have to abide in the vine, and we have to abide in Christ. Salvation is in His body, according to Ephesians chapter 5. And so if we want to be saved, we have to be in Christ. It is that ark of salvation for us. Just as Noah and his family entered into the ark and were saved from the flood because of their presence there in the ark, we enter into Christ and we're preserved by being there and by remaining there. He says, Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Mercy, peace, and love. What precious attributes these are. And Jude prays that they will be multiplied for them. Now, when we think about the nature of this epistle, you're going to see that their peace is being disrupted. There are those that are disturbing the peace. 
And so Jude is praying that their peace might be multiplied. Literally, that this problem might be solved, that it might go away, and that their peace might remain and might even grow. He understood their need for mercy because these false teachers were not going to show any mercy. False teachers are often identified in the Scriptures as entering in, not sparing the flock. A, a wolf doesn't have any mercy on the sheep. He doesn't care about the sheep. It's only about him and what he wants. And so Jude prays for them to have mercy because these false teachers aren't going to show them any. And he prays for them to have love, for their love for God to grow, for their love for one another to grow, for their love for him to grow. He wants there to be love. These false teachers may talk about love, but they're not going to demonstrate it. These brethren, if these brethren are going to be able to survive this great threat to their faith, they're going to have to have a great love for one another. You may want to go over later in the epistle and you'll see in verse 20, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Notice that Jude's talking about the relationship that they're supposed to have. This building up is this edification that they'll find in the body. The praying in the Holy Ghost. The supplication that they're going to be involved in. Notice in verse 21, they're keeping themselves. They're guarding themselves in the love of God. They're looking for, they have a hope, and they're guarding that hope. Then in verses 22 and 23, he will talk about the compassion that some have and how they make a difference, and how that others save with fear, pulling individuals out of the fire. That's the kind of love that's going to be required if they're going to withstand this. And he wants that kind of love to be multiplied. Now, if you recall in verse 3, his initial reason for writing, in other words, his, his desire was to write to them of the common salvation of what they shared together as brethren, to write of the relationship that they had. That's what he wanted to write. And so here he prays for that love to be multiplied. Even though he isn't going to get to write the epistle he wanted to, he's still praying that it will be multiplied. But in verse 3, we see this exhortation. He says, Beloved, they are preferred of Jude. He gives great concern for them. He has great interest in them. He said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Jude does what is needful. He does what's needful. He doesn't do what he wants to do. That's write about the common salvation. He does what's needed. And he warns them and exhorts them concerning these false teachers. Now, when we think of 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, we think about the fact that the Bible instructs us to preach the Word, to be instant in season and out of season, to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. To be instant in season and out of season is literally to preach the truth that is needed. I realize that there are preachers who do not want to preach the needed truth because the needed truth often isn't the wanted truth. It isn't what people want to hear. But we have to be more concerned about people's souls than we are about our salary. We have to be more concerned about people's souls than we are how people feel about us or how people think about us. And Jude was concerned about their souls and so he's exhorting them. He's warning them and convicting them of what needs to be done. Now, when we look at verses 3 and 4, uh, we see several things that stand out. First of all, we see the message for which they were to contend. They were to contend earnestly for the faith. The faith refers to the revealed truth. It isn't personal faith being talked about here. We are to contend for personal faith in the sense that we're not to let anyone steal away our faith. And we ought to put up a fight when the devil tries to take away our faith. But that's not what's being talked about here. What's being talked about here is that God has once for all delivered the truth to us. It's contained in these New Testament books. 
And we need to contend for it. We need to fight for it. We don't need to let anyone take away this truth from us. That's, first of all, the message for which we are to contend. Notice the manner in which we are to contend. Earnestly contend. This, this is a struggle for life and death. This isn't merely contending. Some people say, well, I tried. And they give a half-hearted effort. They, they make a little bit of a fuss over things. That's not what's being talked about in this passage. This passage is literally, you're locked in hand-to-hand combat and someone's going to die. Who's it going to be? Are you going to contend as if it is for your life? Well, that's what Jude's talking about right here, this earnestly contending for the faith, which was once delivered to the saints. And then he tells us the men with whom we are to contend. These men are identified in verse 4, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But first of all, we see that the saints are exhorted. They're exhorted to contend for the faith. They're exhorted to take a stand against these men uh, that are attacking the truth. But notice beginning in verse 4, we see that the spies are exposed. Verse 4 tells us that these men are crept in unawares. What picture do you get of somebody who's creeping in? They're not stomping in, are they? They're not making a lot of noise. No, they're trying to make as little noise as they possibly can. It's the idea of a thief breaking into a house. A thief doesn't make any more noise than he absolutely has to make. He is being as quiet as he can because he doesn't want anyone to know of his presence. And here are these false teachers, and they have crept in unawares. The brethren are not even aware of their presence. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the fact that these false teachers have crept in. And one day, a postcard arrives. It comes to the brethren, and the brethren gather together, and they read this postcard. And in this postcard, it says, certain men are crept in unawares. That's the burglar alarm going off, isn't it? That's the car alarm going off. Here's the person who's getting in, and they think that they've gotten by with it, and then all of a sudden an alarm goes off. They've been detected. Now, when we think about what's happening, think about these brethren that are in the middle of them now, and Jude has just pointed out their presence. They're there. Here's who they are. Here's what they're trying to do. They've been detected. There are certain men crept in unawares. He says, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation? Now, what Judas is saying is that it's always been the case in every dispensation that those who teach that which is, which is false are condemned. It was true in the patriarchal dispensation. It was true in the mosaical dispensation. It's true in the Christian dispensation. If you teach that which is false, you're condemned. You remember the mosaical dispensation that the warning was given if a prophet speaks a certain thing and it doesn't come to pass? He used to be rejected. You're not to listen to him. You're not to believe him. He's condemned. He's a false prophet. And here Jude's talking about those who are condemned because of what they're doing. They're ungodly men. They're not men who are promoting godliness. They're men who are promoting ungodliness. Now, in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, Peter says that God has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So God's Word is that which pertains to life and that which pertains to godliness. Those who bring another doctrine aren't bringing godliness. They're not going to help you be more godly. They're not going to help you be more like God would have you to be. Whatever they bring, whatever they teach, is going to be in the opposite direction. It's going to be ungodliness, because it isn't according to the truth of God's Word. He says, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. 
Is there anything more precious than the grace of God? And yet today, is there anything that's more abused than the grace of God? I don't know of anything that I like to hear presented any better than I do the grace of God. Love to hear the grace of God presented because if it were not for the grace of God, none of us could be saved. None of us would be saved. We understand that. And yet, there's almost every time that you hear that someone's going to preach on grace, almost chill bumps that come up because you're concerned. What's he going to say? Is he going to go the way that so many have gone? In a grace only type of Teaching? Is it going to go the way that so many have in the idea of, of grace and the liberty that it gives us to do whatever we want to do? So many teach today. Is he going to teach the truth in its beauty, in its simplicity concerning the grace of God? They were turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Now, we're going to talk about what lasciviousness is the next hour as we talk about the subject of dancing. And so we're not going to get into lasciviousness right here. We'll save that for the next hour and talk about it there. But basically what they were doing is they were taking the grace of God. And the grace of God, according to Titus chapter 2, if you'll turn there for just a minute, turn back to Titus chapter 2, you'll see the kind of living that grace calls for. And the kind of living that grace calls for is not an unbridled type of living. It's not a freedom to do anything and everything you want to do, but rather grace teaches something very different than that. Grace teaches a restrained kind of living. Notice he says in verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, here's what grace teaches, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. That was the opposite of what these false teachers were teaching. These false teachers were teaching because of the grace of God, you can do what you want to do. You can live this unbridled life. That's not what grace teaches. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. But they were promoting ungodliness. Grace teaches us to deny worldly lust. But they were teaching us to involve ourselves, enjoy ourselves in worldly lust. We should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world. That's what grace teaches. And so if anyone teaches a version of grace that is licentiousness, that allows us to do anything and everything, it's a false form of grace, false teaching about grace. Because that isn't what grace teaches. Grace teaches us to restrain ourselves. Grace teaches us to guard ourselves against immorality. But that isn't what they were doing. They were turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Paul was dealing with that same matter in Romans chapter 6 with those brethren basically who were arguing that, that grace, they could just sin and sin and sin and they didn't have to worry about their sin because of grace. And Paul points out the fact that yes, Grace is capable of covering all of our sins. That's the greatness of grace. But Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's a misuse of grace. That's not what grace is intended to do. Grace is intended to cover your sin, but don't abuse grace. Don't misuse grace. Don't get out here and, and live that way and then expect grace to cover you. Now think about that they're denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They're mutilating grace, and here they're denying God. This may be an early form of the Gnosticism that later developed, denying that Jesus came in the flesh, that Jesus was the Son of God, it may be an early form of that. But obviously, anyone who teaches that other than truth is denying God. And they're denying what God has said. That's what's wrong with theistic evolution. Theistic evolution denies God. It denies the God of the Bible. 
Now, it may, it may say, well, no, we believe that there's a God exists. We just believe that he used evolution to create the world. Well, then you don't really believe in God. You're denying the God of the Bible because the God of the Bible said that isn't the way he did things. You can't have it both ways. But they were teaching some lesser form, lesser doctrine concerning Jesus and, and God. Now, he says in verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. He's going to use the angels, and he's going to use Sodom and Gomorrah in verses 6 and 7. Now, he is pointing out the possibility of apostasy, and that's the way that I've always read these passages. He's pointing out to these brethren, I want to remind you that you can fall from grace. Here are these brethren that are turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. They're basically teaching you to live any way you want to live. Don't worry about it. Grace has got you covered. But Jude says, I want to remind you of something. I want to remind you of the fact that the children of Israel, they were saved out of Egypt. That was the grace of God. God delivered them out of Egypt by His grace. But He afterward destroyed them when they didn't believe and when they didn't follow through with their commitment to serve Him. He talked about the angels. He said, you want to talk about grace? Talk about those that were in the very presence of God. And yet they fell from their estate. Think about Sodom and Gomorrah. How that God for years tolerated them. But it finally got to the point to where God wouldn't tolerate them anymore. And God destroyed them. And even today, we do not know exactly where they were. We know the region where they were. But those cities were completely wiped off the face of the earth. And so Jude's pointing out to these brethren, you need to remember that though you enjoy the grace of God, you can lose that grace. But there's a, there's a greater point to this than just the realization that they could fall from grace. And that is that the examples that he uses are examples of these false teachers. Now think about, if we follow that logic and it seems to... Follow, because in verse 8 you'll see he says, likewise. He's given three examples, and now he says, likewise. Like these three examples, the people that I'm talking to you about, these deceivers, these false teachers, these spies that have crept in among you, that they, they fit this description, he says. Now, if that's the case, then in verse 5, we would believe that these false teachers were brethren. They were people who had been saved and afterwards went astray. We would believe that these individuals are individuals who left, left the position that God had for them, the place that God had for them, rebelling against the authority as the angels did in verse 6. And we would see in verse 7 that like Sodom and Gomorrah, they became more and more corrupt in their living. Now, when you go down and look at verse 8 of these false teachers, see if that isn't the way he identifies them. Likewise, also, these filthy dreamers. That's the corruption of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? They could only think in an evil way. They were filthy in their thoughts. He said they defiled the flesh. That was true. Notice in verse 7 the description of Sodom and Gomorrah giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh. Here are their thoughts. Here are their drives. Here's their excess in those areas. And then he talks about those that despise dominion. Those are the angels in verse 6 who despise the place that God had for them. And think about those who speak evil of dignities. That's the children of Israel in verse 5. You remember how they murmured against God? and murmured against what God had done for them in delivering them from Egypt, accusing God of bringing them out there that, they might that He might destroy them. And so you see how the pattern fits uh, with these false teachers. Now, think about as well, we've seen their mutilation of grace, and now we see their manifestation in these examples. He continues in verse 9 by saying, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation. The Lord rebuke thee. Here's Michael the archangel, a very powerful being, disputing with another powerful being, but he's careful how he does it because he recognizes 
his power, and he recognizes his place. But these false teachers, they're not like that. They don't have that kind of respect for authority. Good or bad, they don't have respect for authority. They despise dominion. They speak evil of dignities. We, we've talked about before uh, the President of the United States. We can disagree with him, and I'm convinced we ought to disagree with him on many things. But we have a responsibility to show respect for the office. Now, we may not respect the man, and we may not agree with his policies concerning abortion, concerning homosexuality, concerning these other things. But we ought to have respect for the office. And we ought to speak properly of that office. Because we have a responsibility of respecting dignity. Government is a minister of God. It's intended to be for good. And that's what God envisioned for government. Sometimes it fails to be that. But that's what God envisions for it, and we need to have the proper respect for it and for its role in our lives. But here, they're disputing. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally, as brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Here, they're like brute beasts. They're given over to the flesh and the drives of the flesh. That's their nature. It says in verse 11, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. And when we think about these are further manifestations of who they are, they're like Cain, who murdered his brother. They're like Balaam, who ran after reward. They're like Korah, who challenged authority. That's the way they are. Here's their manifestation. Here's how you're going to recognize them. He says in verse 12, These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. They're spots. Literally, they're hidden rocks. They pose a danger to you. If you don't see them, you run into them, they'll sink you. Verse 13, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. They're wandering stars. You can't use them to chart your course. They're not trustworthy. You look to the star for guidance to go in a certain direction, but he said the next time you look, it's over here, and then it's over there. You can't trust them because they're not holding to the truth of God's Word. They're wandering stars, and they'll lead you astray. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. The blackness of darkness. You want a description, a definition of outer darkness? Here it is. The blackness of darkness. You remember the darkness that descended upon Egypt? It was so dark they couldn't see their hand in front of their face. That's the blackness of darkness. That's the type of darkness that is described. It's a darkness that can be felt. That's the darkness of eternal destruction. And these individuals are headed toward that darkness. It has been reserved for them. You see, reservations are made in both places. Reservations are made in heaven. That's what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 14 and verses 1 through 3. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to make a reservation for you. I'm going to make room for you. I'm going to make a place for you. Reservations in heaven. But here we learn that there are reservations in the other place too. Where are your reservations? Are your reservations in heaven? Are your reservations in hell? Have you ever made reservations and when you got there it wasn't at all what you thought it was going to be? And we've made reservations before, made them online, did our best to check out what it was going to be like, and then we got there and it was dirty, it was run down. There are people that are making reservations today and they have heaven in mind. But they're going to find the opposite when they get there. We need to be sure 
about our reservations. You know, there are sites that you can go to on the internet and you can, you can check out hotels. And generally speaking, you do a pretty good job of it. You can go and you can read what others have, have written and what others have said. And you can judge by what they've written or by what they've said whether or not it's a place that you want to stay. Well, when we think about the reservations that we're making, we can read what men have said. And what they've said is inspired. It can be trusted. It's going, that's it's describing perfectly the way it's going to be. And we can read those things and we can make sure that our reservations are where we want them to be. That we're going to be happy when we get there. Not going to be true of these false teachers. Notice in verse 14, Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. He's going to refer to two different prophecies, the first of Enoch right here, but then he's going to talk about what Peter had written in verse 17, as Peter had warned that there would be mockers in the last time. That's 2 Peter 3 and verse 3. So he's, he's bringing out to these brethren, these false teachers are present. They're there. He's bringing out to them what, how they can identify these people. But then he's, he's bolstering up his case by pointing out that this was prophesied beforehand. This is, this is not something that was unforeseen. God knew these people were going to come. God knew that this type of thing was going to arise. And He's already written concerning it. Now the reason why it's necessary for Jude to do that more so than it might be of somebody else, is that Jude's not an apostle. Jude's a servant of Jesus Christ, but he's not an apostle. But he refers to what an apostle said. He talks about what Peter's written, emphasizing that Peter said this as well. You ought to believe it, not only because I'm saying it, but you ought to believe it because Peter also said it. He's linking himself with Peter in that way, and that's important. It says in verse 15, "...to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against." This is a pretty good illustration in verse 15 of what elders are supposed to do. It's what these angels are doing. It says they're convincing, they're executing judgment, they're convincing all that are ungodly of their ungodly deeds. Remember in Titus chapter 1, the role of an elder is to convince the gainsayers. That's what's being talked about right here. You convince them by pointing out how their deeds are ungodly, how their deeds are contrary to what God wants. He says, of all their hard speeches which ungodly speak, sinners have spoken against him. Have you ever thought about all the things that men have said about Jesus Christ? All the horrible things that they've said about him? Jude says the Lord's coming. He's coming with His saints. And He's going to judge those. And He's going to convince those that have said those things about Him. Do you understand Philippians chapter 2 where Paul says, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. There will not be a single person on Judgment Day who will not be fully convinced. Every one of them will. There will not be a person on Judgment Day that will not bow. Everyone will. These false teachers, they may deny the Lord right now, verse 4, but one day they're going to confess Him. They may refuse to submit right now, but Jude says one day they're going to submit. One of these days the Lord's going to come with His saints 
and they're going to submit. And he's going to convince them of their deeds. He says in verse 16, These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons and admiration for the sake of advantage. Now Jude says of these individuals, they're murmurers and complainers. We all know people who murmur and complain. Those are not people we ought to be around. They're not people we ought to be around. You know they're not with Jesus, or they wouldn't be doing that. You find Jesus doing that? You find Jesus sitting around murmuring and complaining? You ever read that in the Gospels, that that's what Jesus was doing? I don't ever find Jesus doing that. That's not what's done in His presence. That's what's done by those who are separated from Jesus. It's not done by those that are with Jesus. They don't murmur. They don't complain. They have men's persons and admiration because of advantage. We've already talked about Rand greedily in the era of Balaam. Here, they're doing this because they want to get something. This is their motivation. We saw their mutilation in verse 4. We saw their manifestation in the next verses. Now here, uh, we see their motivation. And their motivation is to get an advantage. He says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their ungodly lust. Now, as we think about these false teachers, they're manifested in two ways. We've talked about it now. I'll try to summarize it. They're manifested by their dirty minds. And they're manifested by their disrespectful mouths. They have dirty minds. They're filthy dreamers. They defile the flesh. They have disrespectful mouths. They despise dominion. They speak evil of dignities. Okay. Now notice in verse 19, they be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. In contrast to these, he's going to talk about the brethren. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. They tear down, you need to build up. You have a holy faith, they're known for their ungodliness. They mock. They disbelieve. You believe. Praying in the Holy Ghost. They don't have the Spirit. You do have the Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. They've gone astray. They're wandering, wandering stars. You don't go astray. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. They don't show mercy, but you look for mercy. Verse 22, And if some have compassion, making a difference... And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Here, the context for this is, here are the wolves that are ravaging the flock. And Jude says, don't just run away, but help one another. Pull people out of the fire. When we see congregations that are being infiltrated by error, the easiest thing in the world to do is to run away. We have a responsibility to our brothers and sisters in Christ to try to get them out of that. To try to keep them from being overwhelmed by that. If we see it, we have to show it to them and try to save them. The last couple of verses here talk about that the Savior is exalted. Now unto Him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, the glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. They will deny Jesus. But Jude is going to exalt Him. He wants them to see who Jesus is and that their only hope is Jesus. That's the only way they can keep from falling. That's the only way they can enjoy the grace of God is by believing in Jesus. These men are preaching a form of grace. The form of grace that they're preaching doesn't involve Jesus. The form of grace that Jude is preaching involves Jesus Christ. Thank you for your attention.